In this chapter, we're going to take a look at different viruses that all have RNA as their genetic material that cause human disease. My warning, there's a lot of them. So we've already gone over a ton of bacteria that can cause human disease. We've gone over viruses that have DNA that cause disease. Now there's a whole bunch more viruses that have RNA that cause disease. Now, again, like a lot of the organisms, you might not recognize the virus names. You might recognize more of the diseases that they cause. So let's get started on different RNA containing viruses. Now, it's a diverse group because there's a lot of variation in what they can have as their genetic material. It's not just they have RNA. It's do they have single-stranded RNA? Do they have double-stranded RNA? Do they have the positive strand of the single-stranded RNA or that opposite negative strand? Uh, do they have an envelope or are they the naked viruses? Are their RNA, is it segmented or is it one long circular section of RNA? So there's lots of different ways we can group RNA viruses because there are so many of them. Now, this diagram, I kind of like because it may be more than this one, I'm not sure. But it's how I'm going to go through all of the different RNA viruses. So again, we group them based on if they have an envelope or if they're naked, if they have the positive strand or the negative strand, if their genetic material is segmented or not. It could be in one big circular chunk of genetic material or it's in little tiny chunks of genetic material. But we're going to start with the red, we're going to start on the top left and we're going to work our way around to the black. Ooh, ignore that random blue arrow, it's supposed to be over there. But we're going to work our way around, so we're going to start with the envelope segmented negative strand of single stranded RNA. Now of the viruses that are in, the, in this group, we have the orthomixiviridae group, we also have the bunyaviridae and the arenaviridae group. The orthomixaviridae are known for the ones that cause the flu, when you talk about the flu. And the bunyaviridae and arenaviridae, they're both animal viruses and humans generally pick them up, most of them, not all, but most of them are animal or zoonotic viruses and we pick them up with contact with animals. Again, we'll talk about ones that don't fit that, that zoonotic transmission. Most are zoonotic viruses. But we're going to start first with those orthomixiviridae, the flu viruses. Now, this particular virus targets the respiratory tract. It's spread through respiratory secretions. Now, it targets the cells of the respiratory tract, gets inside, reproduces, it leaves. However, it does cause damage to the cells of our respiratory tract. And it's because of that damage to the respiratory tract, which is a huge first line of defense of everything we breathe in. We do suffer a lot of secondary infections. When you lose the first line of defense, you open yourself up to a lot of secondary infections. Now, the structure, there we go, of the virus itself. So it's segmented. Here's all the segments of that single-stranded RNA that it has. And the outside has two glycoproteins, and I don't really care too much that you know the full name of them, just if you recognize NAs or HAs, but it's those outer proteins that recognize the cells of a respiratory tract, but it's also, they're very, they're variable. So just in this one picture, they kind of form a pattern of almost a three to one ratio of the NAs to HAs, but they can vary. And anytime they vary, it's a new flu strain, and they're constantly varying themselves. Now, this slight change is called antigenic drift. I like to think, oh, they're just drifting along, changing a little bit, and anytime it changes, it's a completely different flu. This is why we have to get flu vaccines every single year, is that the virus is constantly changing. So what you get vaccinated for one year, and I'm like, there's probably new strains the next year, and so we're gonna need a new virus. So the CDC, they do in the, the World Health Organization, they track what are the trends. Are, they, are the viruses seeming to get more HAs or NAs in their outer? Uh, envelope and so they track and they try to make vaccines based on trends they're not always accurate but they try to do the best and either way 
your body still recognizes that virus itself, even if it's not the exact strain, and so you generally have lesser side effects for a shorter period of time. Now there is some, another way we can get new strains of flu viruses, and it's called antigenic shift. And it's a little different than drift. So drift, they're just slightly changing. Antigenic shift really is a combination of two different animal viruses, one that affects humans, one that affects animals. I mean, they're both animals, we're animals. But there are two different viruses and their genetics mix together and we get a completely different virus. Now, most of those are then named for the animal that they came from. So drift is why we constantly need that new flu vaccine because they're always changing. But antigenic shift is when all of a sudden we get a brand new, you know, recom recombined flu. So this is kind of showing the difference, antigenic drift. When a virus goes into a cell, because all these changes, all the changes always happen intracellular, some mixing around a little bit, mutation, change, something, so what comes out of the cell is slightly different. So when you get the flu, what you're coughing onto someone else could be a slightly different strain than what you got. Now, antigenic shift is when two completely different flu viruses, they are flu viruses, but two completely different flu viruses from different hosts or sources go into a cell, their genetics mix up. And I do like how the book puts red plus blue equals purple comes out, a completely different strain. Now, the interesting part about antigenic shift, and we're not sure why, but antigenic shift seems to come about about every 10 years that about every 10 years, we seem to develop a brand new, highly infectious flu virus. Now, these are normally named again for where the animals they came from. And so we had the bird flu and we had the swine flu. The swine flu came about the winter of 2009, 2010. And so 2019, 2020 winter, yeah, due for a completely new flu virus. Now, I've been predicting this for several years now that the winter of 2019, 2020, we're due for a new virus. Well, we got one. It doesn't fit into the orthomyxoviridae group, but it did come from a combination of change from an animal virus. And that's our very own COVID-19 was discovered in December 2019, and it's taken off like crazy in this year. So it's not an orthomix of flu virus, but this change, this combining of different viruses did happen. And again, we're not sure why it seems to happen every 10 years, but it does. Now, this is showing that antigenic shift, that combining. You can take a duck flu virus and a human flu virus, they can go into a whole nother animal, and what comes out is slightly different. And so the immune system can't recognize anything, any part of the duck virus, and so it's a completely different virus that usually is gonna suffer more side effects because the body doesn't recognize anything similar. It's not a normal flu virus that we would have gotten and be able to recognize any parts of. Now, there are different flu strains that infect humans. We've got the influenza A, influenza B, and influenza C. Influenza A is the more virulent strain. In 2003, we had an, uh, a kind of an antigenic shift that happens with bird flu, or am I with birds, that this particular flu strain mixed with some virus that infected birds, and we ended up with the bird flu. Uh, still not taken off like COVID-19, but of the influenza strains, influenza A is more virulent. Influenza B generally doesn't undergo any type of antigenic shift. It doesn't like to mix with other kinds of animal viruses, but it still does change all the time. It still does antigenic drift. Influenza C generally only causes some minor respiratory issues, usually not any type of epidemic. So when they test you for the flu. If you have the flu, if they want to diagnose you that you have a flu, they're looking to see if you have influenza A or influenza B. In different years, one seems to be more prevalent over the other. Either way, they're both gonna, you're both gonna suffer the same type of conditions. Now, influenza A, this also works with B as well. It is a highly contagious respiratory illness. 
usually seasonal, usually those winter months is when we have the highest number of cases, and it is one of the top 10 causes of death in the United States is from the flu. Now, mostly that usually happens in elderly and small children. They have the weaker immune systems. Now, because this virus does bind to the respiratory tract and it causes damage to those ciliated cells, we lose that first line of defense. Now, because of the damage to the respiratory tract as well, we usually suffer from symptoms indicating a respiratory issue, shortness of breath, coughing, you might have a throat pain, but it can lead to fever, headaches, and myalgia, muscle pain. And so you're tired, you're achy, you've got a fever. The interesting part about the flu that you might not see on there is a symptom. Diarrhea and vomiting is not a normal flu symptom. This particular virus does not generally attack the intestinal tract. Generally, there's always cases, but it generally does not attack uh, attack the intestinal tract. It's you're generally going to have symptoms from your immune system that you're under attack, and you're going to have symptoms from respiratory damage that you're under attack. The problem is because you lose your first line of defense, you are more likely to pick up some other type of secondary bacterial infection, like pneumonia or some other type of bacteria that can lend lead, then lead to vomiting and diarrhea. So if you have all the symptoms of the flu and you have vomiting or diarrhea, you're generally suffering from the flu and something else. And it's because of that damage to your first line of defense. Now diagnosing the flu, well we do have some fluorescent, immunofluorescent tests. They're usually gonna take a pharyngeal or a nasopharyngeal swab. They're gonna go way up there with a swab and they're gonna do an immunofluorescence test. They can also do antibody titers and they can look to see are you developing antibodies against a, a particular flu strain. Treatment mostly is controlling symptoms. If you've got a fever, take something to lower the fever. If you're having congestion, take some type of decongestant. Otherwise, we do have some antivirals on the market. Generally, the sooner you can get the antivirals in the body, the better they're gonna work. Because most of these antivirals stop the spreading of the virus from one cell to another cell. But if you already have a full bone outbreak in your body, it's not gonna do a lot. Your immune system is what has to kick in at that point. But if you can take some of these at the earliest onset of symptoms, it can kind of knock it down and your immune system can get rid of anything that is there. And it speeds up your recovery time. Now, some of these are starting to develop resistance to some of these antivirals, but we do have some that still can be taken. Otherwise, the best recommendation is get the annual flu vaccine. Again, it is not always accurate. They are making predictions because they have to make predictions a ways out so they can mass produce the flu vaccine every year. But even if they are wrong, there are still antigens in that vaccine that wake your immune system up to an orthomyxovirus so that your immune system might still recognize it and it can still have a faster immune response. So then those that even get the flu are gonna suffer less severe side effects of the flu. So even if you don't get the right flu vaccine strain, if you get vaccinated, you're still gonna recognize some of that, those flu viruses and have a better response, immune response time. Now, some of the other viruses that are in this group as well, it's not just all about the flu, are the bunion viruses and the arena viruses. These are generally, they're transmitted zoonotically, so from animal to us in some fashion. Usually we have some epidemics here and there. Uh, they can be extremely dangerous. We consider them our biosafety level four viruses. So people that work with them have to have pretty much the full hazmat outfit on. But some of the common ones that are found around here, California encephalitis, Rift Valley fever, and lacrosse encephalitis. That yes, lacrosse encephalitis, that's this lacrosse. We are, we are in the textbooks, people, which isn't, in, which isn't a great thing. It is an encephalitis. It's a virus that's picked up from the bite of a, of a mosquito 
and it does cause that inflammation of the brain tissue, it can be deadly. Now, why it's called lacrosse encephalitis? Because the first known death was, it was a young boy that had died of this. They had never seen it before. He was from lacrosse, and because it was first diagnosed in someone that was from lacrosse, it's now called lacrosse encephalitis. Yay for us. Another virus that's in our Bunya virus group that's found here in America is the Hanta virus. This one comes from animals but not spread by insects or ticks. And this one's spread by contact with dried feces generally from mice. So this is a virus that's carried by deer as well as mice. So if you have mice in your house, this is a virus that you could pick up. It's rare, we do not have a lot of cases around here, but there have been cases around here. And it can cause a high fever, it can cause respiratory distress, we can have the edema, and it has about a 33% mortality rate, so it's not great. So again, it's pretty rare that we find cases, but occasionally it happens. Now, this is just to show some diseases that are spread by insect. And in the Bunya Viridae group, there's our very own lacrosse encephalitis. Yay! Now, another that fits into this group, it's an arena virus group. It's still spread by animals. It's spread generally by rodents. We don't have a lot of cases around here. Most of the cases of arena viruses are usually in Africa, but if you travel and you know you're gonna have contact with rodents, the rodents usually pick it up by contact with dogs. And so if you know that you're traveling somewhere, you know there's viruses around, you know, taking extra precaution to make sure you stay away from any of those areas. It's usually transmitted through aerosols from infected animals or direct contact. So, you know, be, be wary of where you go. Hepatitis D, again, we've got several hepatitises. We talked about one hepatitis B in DNA viruses. All the other hepatitises are RNA viruses. So hepatitis D, it's spread by bodily fluids. So sexual activity, contaminated needles are the top ways that it needs to get in the body. The interesting part about hepatitis D is that for it to hijack host cells and for host cells to reproduce the virus, it requires the hepatitis B virus to be present. So it almost needs the workings of the hepatitis B. It needs the information that hepatitis B has for it to hijack cells and reproduce. So again, it can cause hepatitis. It's gonna target the liver cells. It can cause inflammation of the liver. Any kind of damage to the liver can put you at an increased risk of liver cancer later on in life. Now we don't have a vaccine specifically against hepatitis D, but we do have a vaccine against hepatitis B. And as long as you can keep hepatitis B out of the body, you'll keep hepatitis D out of the body. So when you get your hepatitis B vaccine, you're kind of vaccinating for hepatitis D as well. Now, concept check question, which of these happen in the case of antigenic shift in influenza A? So we're looking at antigenic shift. Well, antigenic shift is any recombination of RNA segments between bird and human strains or other animals, swine as well. But it's that recombination, that mixing of genetics and DNA or RNA from two different organisms. Now, we're moving our way down. So we got the orthomyxa, the bunyaviridae, arenaviruses, and we're moving our way down to our enveloped single-stranded RNA. And some of them have the negative strands, some of them have the positive strand, but they're all enveloped, so it means they steal our host cell membrane, and they all have a single strand. Now, they're also unsegmented, so it's one big chunk of RNA. Now, in the negative strand group, we have the paramyxaviridae group, and there's a bunch of viruses in the paramyxaviridae group. Now, the paramyxaviridae group, anything in this group, any viruses in this group, all of these viruses will cause cells to combine and group together and form these large multinucleated syncytia. Other viruses do this as well, but all of them in the paramyxaviridae group. So they form these large syncytia, 
and am I combining all of these groups together? It works really well for the virus because when all these cells are now combined together, they can easily move around and reproduce and almost hijack this massive, huge cell. Now the three groups of viruses that we're gonna talk about are the paramyxa of viruses, part of the family name, the measles viruses and the pneumal viruses. Also in this group of enveloped, unsegmented, negative strand of the single-stranded RNA, we have a rhabdoviridae group and a filoviridae group. But we're gonna start first with the paramyxoviridae group. I went too fast. So the first one we're gonna talk about are the parainfluenza virus. Again, in the paramyx of viruses, we have parainfluenza and we have mumps, and we're gonna talk about them separate. So the para the parainfluenza virus, it's a paramyx of virus, it's out there, it's as widespread as the flu is, but it's a little more benign, it's less disease causing than the flu itself. It's spread by respiratory transmission, and normally it's kids that are gonna suffer from say the worst side effects, or even gonna just have any side effects. Some of them can be life-threatening, most are not. But this particular virus, again, like the flu, it targets the respiratory tract. There are four main strains of parainfluenza virus. We just call them one, two, three, and four. Some of them target the lower respiratory tract, some of them target the upper respiratory tract. Now, they generally cause symptoms of the minor cold, that coughing, runny nose, minor, minor fever, but they can cause bronchitis, they can cause bronchopneumonia, and they can cause a condition known as croup. Now, croup, and I'm like, I've got audio if I can get it to work, uh, but croup, generally you're gonna have, because of the damage to the respiratory tract itself, an inflammation of the respiratory tract, you're normally gonna have a more labored breathing, a noisy breathing, that the breathing itself is noisy, that's because of inflammation of the respiratory tract, and you're gonna have a more hoarse cough. It's almost like a deep cough. Now, the deep cough, they say it sounds almost like a seal barking, so if you've ever been to some kind of zoo where they've had seals there, and the little seal barked, because they bark, uh, it's what croup sounds like. <coughs> Stop right there. Again, it, I can picture myself, I can picture a seal at the zoo making this coughing sound. Now, there's no specific treatment. It's generally just all supportive care. And I'm like treating the symptoms, making, you know, you comfortable if you're having inflammation, taking some type of inflammatory, otherwise taking decongestions, you know, anything to try to make yourself comfortable. Most recover without any long lasting issues. So I'm like, the only time it can be life-threatening is usually very young children. And even, it's, it's rare to be life-threatening. Most recover with no issues whatsoever. The next that's in our paramyxovirus is the mumps virus. Now, this particular virus targets the parotid salivary gland, and so it causes inflammation of the parotid salivary gland. Sometimes on both sides, it's, this is the salivary gland that's found in that lower cheek, but it also can affect both sides as well. So it's gonna have painful swelling of the salivary gland. Now, humans are the only reservoir of this particular virus. No other animal carries it. About 40% of infections are subclinical, which means no symptoms whatsoever, which means could be spreading out without having any idea. Now, good news is, is that if you have picked it up, it does have a really long, you have a long-term immunity. So whether you've had a vaccine or you've actually suffered from mumps, you normally have a pretty long-term immunity to it. Now, here in the United States, we see about 300 cases a year. Again, usually winter time, we have higher numbers of cases. The incubation period is about two to three weeks. So if someone coughed on you, it spread respiratory droplets. So if someone coughed on you, sneezed on you, about two to three weeks later, you start to develop the symptoms, the fever, muscle pain, tired, and that swelling of one or both cheeks. Now, because of the location of the salivary gland to your ears, it has been known to cause deafness. So just because of damage to the eardrums and all of the inflammation that happens. Now, treatment, 
generally you're just treating the symptoms. We don't have any type of antiviral that works. The best is just prevention, not getting it at all. And we do have the MMR vaccine. It's the measles, mumps, and rubella. Now, since the vaccine came out in 1967, we have had a massive decrease in the number of cases of mumps. However, we're starting to see a trend in the last five to 10 years of more and more cases. And again, that is because less people are vaccinating. Now, a vaccine is not 100% effective. This particular vaccine has an effectiveness rate of around 90%. That means 10% of people that got the vaccine could still pick up this particular virus. So then there's the question of, well, why would I even wanna get a vaccine? Well, the hope is that if everyone gets vaccinated, even if you were the unlucky 10% that it didn't work on you, if no one around you has this virus because everyone's gotten vaccinated, you're not gonna pick it up. This is the herd immunity. If everyone is immune and you aren't, well, there's no one to give it to you. So we vaccinate enough. We need enough people to get vaccinated. We've had cases around here. This happened in the spring of 2017 here at UW La Crosse uh, in town. And it was again, several, several, three people were confirmed to have mumps. They had left to go on spring break. They went home, they picked it up and they brought it back here. So they isolated them, they sent them home. So it's around, there are cases of mumps around. Now, another virus in this group, it's still in the Paramyxoviridae family, so it still makes the syncytia, is the measles virus. Now, it is spread by humans. The humans are the only carriers. It's not found in any other type of animal. And it's spread in large, dense populations. It's spread by respiratory droplets. It's extremely contagious. And so if someone coughing, sneezing anywhere near you, even talking, you could pick it up. Now, it does initially target the respiratory tract before starting to spread throughout the body. Some of the initial symptoms of this virus is normally a dry cough, so an unproductive cough, headache, you might have a fever, you might have conjunctivitis or pink eye. Uh, it eventually could, depending where it goes in the body, lead to ear infections, sinus infections. So it spreads throughout the body. You all generally, as it starts to spread, have a widespread spread body rash. And it usually starts on the head and works its way down to you have a full body rash. Now one unique characteristic of this virus, because lots of things cause fever, inflammation, headaches, things like that, is inside the mouth it causes these white spots to appear. So if you pulled your gums back you would actually see these white spots. They say they look like white halos with a little bit of red inflammation around it. That's a unique characteristic to this virus. Well, a lot of times it's diagnosed based on a oh, widespread body rash and then those complex spots in the mouth. They generally don't do any other type of test. It's a unique enough characteristic. Now, most of the time people recover fine from measles. However, it can cause rare complications. It can cause pneumonia, it can cause encephalitis, it can cause something known as subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is described more on this, and again, it's breakdown, it's damage to the brain tissue itself. Well, that's never good. Now, luckily it's rare, only about one case in a million infections that this happens, but it is deadly. So this virus has killed because it causes damage to the brain tissue. Now, luckily we can prevent this particular virus because we have a vaccine. We have that MMR vaccine for measles, mumps, and rubella. Now, the number of cases of measles went way down after we came up with the vaccine. However, we are starting to see a trend in the number of cases going up. Now, my note on this huge, massive case right here, one of the one outbreak that happened this year, there's a reason why I had this picture. There was an outbreak that happened at Disneyland out in California that a whole group of individuals, the winter of 2014, 2015, picked up this virus when they went to Disneyland, you know, so happiest place on earth, but large dense populations and it's extremely infectious. Now, my note though on measles, because it still hasn't made our most current textbook additions yet, we've had another recent measles outbreak. It's 
kind of getting forgotten about a little bit because of the COVID, COVID outbreak, but measles vaccination rate right, people aren't vaccinating uh, that at the rate that they need to. And so, yes, the fall, winter, 2018, 19, we're having a huge outbreak. I mean, normally we see a hundred cases a year in the United States. That's again, we vaccinate, but we're talking, we're now seeing hundreds of measles cases just here in the United States that it got to the point that we were starting to ban people from different areas, especially in areas where they were having an outbreak. It's kind of stoning familiar to COVID-19. We're stopping people from congregating. Problem is we can't tell you to go get vaccinated because we don't have a vaccine yet. So that, yeah, and like it's all because we do not have the high enough vaccination rate. Because those that were showing the highest percentage of cases were in groups that they weren't vaccinating. I'm trying to see if I go back. Now, uh, treatment for measles. Unfortunately, we don't have any treatment. It's mostly treating symptoms. They have shown that taking vitamin A injections early on seems to decrease the symptoms, but otherwise we don't have any universal treatment that works. Now, our next groups and our last one that's in the paramyxoviridae family, so the last one that still forms that syncytia is the pneumovirus, also known as the respiratory syncytial virus. This unfacts the upper respiratory tract, and again, it forms that syncytia, those fused cells in the respiratory tract. Well, you have cells in the respiratory tract, and they're there for gas exchange, but if you fuse them all together, they can't do that very well anymore. Now, this particular virus causes the worst signs and symptoms on infants, those usually six months or younger, that it can cause a fatal respiratory infection. Now, for children and even adults, a lot of adults are asymptomatic, which means they could be carrying it and spreading it, but and like it's picked up through respiratory droplets or if it gets into the eye, so touching eyes, and it can cause fever, it can cause inflammation of the nose, the, rhin the rhinitis, it can cause the pharyngitis, so it causes that sore throat, it can cause ear infections, and it can cause croup. It, however, can cause that respiratory distress in infants, and respiratory distress meaning the infants aren't getting the oxygen they need because all of those few cells in the respiratory tract aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, treatment, we have some treatments. Again, this, the sooner you can get treated, it's always the better. But we do have a couple antibodies that help block the virus from attaching to cells so that it can't go infect more cells. But a lot of times by the time you have the worst symptoms and by the time they finally diagnose it and figure out what it is, sometimes it might be too late even for the antivirals. Now, our next group, it's the still in our enveloped negative sense, single-stranded RNA, but all one big chunk of RNA. It's the rhabdovirus group, and it's the virus that's in this group that is where we get the rabies disease. So they are enveloped, but the unique part about their capsid is that their capsid has a bullet shape to it. So it's a unique shape. It doesn't just have the cylinder. It, uh, it doesn't have the icosahedral shape. It has a bullet shape to it. Now, the virus is a slow, progressive zoonotic disease, which means we pick it up by contact with animals but it's really slow. A lot of viruses, some of them, you're gonna see signs and symptoms in a week. You might even be dead within a week or two weeks. This virus is really slow. You might not even see signs and symptoms for months later. There's documented cases that people don't see signs and symptoms for even years after they pick it up. Now, the problem though is by the time you see signs and symptoms, it's deadly. There's no, oh, we'll try and treat. It's deadly. By the time you see signs and symptoms, you're going to die. There's no ifs or what, try this or what ifs. It is a deadly virus. Now, the primary reservoirs where this virus hangs out are in wild animals. 
but it can be spread from wild animals to domestic animals, your pets, if your pets get bitten, scratched, or inhale the droplets from these animals. So if they're in any, so if you've got a pet and you know it's in any kind of contact with wild animals, your pet is at risk of picking up this particular virus and we're then at risk from picking it up from the pets. My cute little skunk. The, the top reservoir of infection in our area in the country are skunks. Little skunk. Now, the rabies virus, it enters through a bite. So if you get bitten by one of these infected animals, the virus grows for about a week and then it starts to move into the nervous system. So it damages the nervous system. Now, eventually, it's going to make it into the salivary glands of an animal, which is why we get pick it up through a bite. Now, the phases it's gonna go through. The first phase is the prodromal phase. This is the first phase that you know something's not right. And again, it could be months before you see this first phase. Fever, nausea, vomiting, headache, fatigue. Maybe pain, burning, or tingling sensation at the site of the wound. Again, lots of things can cause these symptoms, so a lot of times people don't even go into the doctor at this point. Either way, it's still too late, but they still don't go to the doctor at this point. Then when we get into what's known as the furious phase, I like the name of these phases. So you have the prodromal phase, the initial phase, then you have the furious phase, where patients become agitated, disoriented, they have suffer from seizures, there's twitching, and they develop something known as hydrophobia. Again, you have damaged your immune system, and so it could cause you to act different now, this is agitation. You know, you're upset about things that you normally wouldn't be. Um, it causes the twitching because it's controlling the nervous system that controls the muscles. Now, hydrophobia, the word means fear of water. Now, that doesn't mean people go around and see a puddle on the ground and freak out because there's a puddle. However, because it causes inflammation and pain in the throat, people and animals stop drinking water. It's just, it's almost pain, too painful to swallow. Then it can develop into what's known as the dumb phase. This is a full paralyzation, disorientation, and stuporous. You kind of walk around having no idea what's going on. Um, like, almost like you were extremely drunk. And it will then progress to the coma phase. Now, eventually it will, it will result in death. Like it's a, it will. Now, diagnosing rabies. It's often diagnosed at autopsy. Now, that's, that's a big indication. By the time you have symptoms, you're gonna die. It's no, normally diagnosed to, to confirm at autopsy. This isn't something they're gonna do a PCR or they're gonna do some type of immunofluorescence test or a titer. It's often diagnosed at autopsy. Now, how they diagnose at autopsy is they're going to take a nervous tissue sample, brain tissue, spinal cord, and they're going to look underneath the microscope and they look for these dark staining bodies called negri bodies in the nervous tissue. Now, how to prevent it? Well, because we pick it up through the bite of animals, if you get bitten by an animal, one that you don't know, you don't know if it's been treated, well, at that bite site, you need to wash it thoroughly, but then go to the doctor right away because if they suspect that it might be a rabbit or rabies containing animal, they will put antibodies right there at the bite site. They want to get those antibodies in at the bite site to bind up this particular virus. Then they're going to give you the vaccine. Now, this is one of those rare viruses that you can get vaccinated for after being exposed. Normally it's, oh, okay, so someone coughed on me and gave me the flu. Now could I get the flu vaccine? <laughs> Doesn't happen. But because this particular virus is such a slow progressive virus, your immune system is faster than it. And so if you get the vaccine after you've been exposed to it, you can actually build up an immune system and it can recognize eventually that there is something foreign and it can target it. So you can get vaccinated 
after being exposed to it. Now, the treatment, again, you're going to give an antibody at the bite site, and then they're going to vaccinate you. So some of you listening might have actually had this particular vaccine done. I haven't. I've heard it's a painful vaccine, and it's six doses with two additional boosters later on. But it's totally worth it because, again, this virus kills. If you wait to have, you just wait, well, the animal bit me. I'll wait to see if I have any signs and symptoms before I go in. It's deadly. It is completely deadly. It is a 99.99999% chance you will die if you wait till symptoms. So, to control. So, we'd rather just not even deal with it. We do vaccinate our domestic animals. We eliminate strays. We try to get them adopted. We get them vaccinated. And then strict quarantine practices that if an animal has bitten someone and we're not sure we can quarantine them to see if they start to show symptoms which then looks to see if we're going to show symptoms so it's vaccinating domestic animals now it's we generally pick it up not from our pets we this virus is not common around pets this virus around here is common in skunks so most people actually pick up this rabies virus from wild animals, not from your pets. Again, it's found in wild animals out there. We can't vaccinate all of the wild animals out there. We just vaccinate the ones we do know that we're going to have close contact with. So most people pick up rabies from some type of wild animal. Now, I said, it's like a guaranteed you're going to die by if you wait till symptoms. However, this made the news and that there was a girl, Wisconsin, yay, we make the news, and for a good thing. There was a girl in the Milwaukee area that is the first to survive rabies without getting the vaccine after a bite site. She had picked it up, and she was at a church, and there was a bat. She got bitten by the bat. She didn't get treated right away. She developed the symptoms. And again, at that point, it's deadly. Again, 99.999. I can't say 100 because of this case. However, when literally there's nothing to lose, when you know your patient has a 100% chance of death, they're going to try anything they can. And so they put her into a coma, and they gave her a bunch of different antiviral drugs. And she lived. Now, they also decreased her body temperature as well as the coma and all these drugs. And she lived. The big question is, we don't know which antiviral drug may have worked. Is it, Do you need the whole combination of drugs? Do you need to be in a coma? Do you need to have your body temperature decreased for how long? We're not exactly sure how it worked. We just know it worked. So they are trying this on patients. So if patients do come into the hospital and they are exhibiting signs of this rabies virus, they are putting them into comas and they are trying to treat with a bunch of different antiviral drugs because if it worked with one, it might work with others and maybe it won't have that 99.9999%. So if you hear about rabies, they actually call this putting into coma and treating with antiviral drugs, the Milwaukee, like it's, this is the Milwaukee treatment for rabies. So they just call it Milwaukee. They don't call it the Wauwatosa for the actual suburb, but they call it the Milwaukee protocol on treating rabies. Again, it's not foolproof, but you might have that slight 0.001% chance of survival. Now, our last little group here with our envelope negative strand is the filoviridae group. Now, it gets the word filo because they say it looks filamentous, meaning it's really long. Sometimes it curls over on itself. Viruses in this group cause hemorrhagic fevers, and the top ones that are known to cause human disease are Marburg and Ebola viruses. Now, it's unknown where the virus came from. This virus hasn't been around for decades or for uh, centuries. I guess it's been around for decades, uh, but it hasn't been around for centuries, so we're unsure of where it actually contained, came from. We do know it's spread by contaminated body fluids and syringes, and we do know because it does full attack and destruction of the liver, that it destroys the liver. The liver is a big pile of mush, and because so much blood goes through the liver, it causes uncontrolled bleeding internally, which then leads to bleeding externally. Now, the signs and symptoms, usually if you're in an area where this virus is around, which is in more African countries, 
they're looking for that fever fatigue, the swelling, the abdominal pain where the liver is, meaning there's liver damage. Generally, the symptoms is diagnostic. Now, treatment, it is, they are deadly viruses. The Marburg kills 90% and the Ebola 75%. Unless I get those flipped around. It, it's a deadly virus. It's not one you want to mess with. You know, the treatment has been fluid replacement. And sorry, this picture went on the word, the word, but they're also developing antibodies that are having some pretty good results. They're called ZMAP antibodies because these are genetically engineered antibodies in a lab. These are not ones where we can expose someone to this virus and then harvest their antibodies. These are genetically made antibodies. Now, as I said, most of the cases of Marburg and Ebola are in Africa. So if you ever travel, it's a virus to be worried about. And it's been making the news in the last few years of more and more outbreaks in African countries. It is a biosafety level virus four, which means that full hazmat suit, you've got your own oxygen supply if you're in a lab working with the virus. In the United States, we've had several cases and even a death from Ebola. Again, it was traveling nurses that were in Africa brought it back. It didn't spread. And I'm like, but again, African countries, they are having outbreaks. Now, next concept check question is which disease or for which disease are active and passive immunizations given at the same time? What's the rabies? It's because we can. Most of the time you're given passive afterwards because you're given antibodies because you didn't do the active first. But this is one because it's so slow. We can give you the active vaccine to wake your immune system up to the virus, to really wake your immune system up that there's something foreign and it needs to mount an immune response. All right, we're working our way through. We're down, got through the purple, got through the phyllo, the rhabda, and the paramyxoviridae, onto our enveloped, positive sense, single-stranded RNA. And it's all one strand, so they're not segmented. And if you didn't know, yep, we're onto the coronaviridae group, or the coronaviruses. Now, the coronaviruses have been around for a long time. They've only recently made the news because of the new strain of coronaviruses coronavirus that's uh, deadly, the COVID-19. Now, they're called coronaviruses. If you didn't know, corona means crown. And they have these spikes all around on the outside. So they say it looks like a crown on the outside of the virus wall. That's where it gets its name. So I'm like, and you can see these under different electron microscopes, those little spikes on the outside. So they get their crown name. Now, there are a lot of coronaviruses found in domesticated animals, in pets. So there are five types that cause issues with humans, and there are different strains among the five types, but coronaviruses cause a lot of the common cold. So if you've had a common cold, you may have had a coronavirus. And everyone's like, oh my god, no, I've had coronavirus. Yeah, you probably have. You've had some coronavirus in your body causing the common cold. There are coronaviruses that can cause pneumonia. They can cause myocarditis. Some can cause enteric infections, diarrhea and vomiting. So maybe the last time you've had diarrhea and vomiting, it was a coronavirus. However, there are some strains of coronaviruses that can cause what's known as severe acute respiratory syndrome. It's a syndrome that's spread respiratory droplets and it causes respiratory distress. Now, SARS, which we call it, and it might is a deadly strain of coronavirus. And it killed about 9% of all of those that were infected. Now, this SARS strain of coronavirus came out around 2002. It caused fever, body aches, tiredness, but it because it caused the respiratory distress, meaning your body can't get the oxygen needed for survival, it caused a lot of deaths. So in the early 2000s, if you remember the early 2000s, I do, that it was found in China. They had the biggest outbreak of it, and everywhere there was pictures of everyone wearing masks. <laughs> Not unlike today with another type of coronavirus. Now, there is a Middle Eastern strain too. It's called the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. That is even more deadly. Luckily, there are less cases of it because treatment is only supportive. We don't have an antiviral that works, even for SARS. Now, the SARS strain that came around in the early 2000s, 
they are working on a vaccine. And I say this, this is almost 20 years later. They are working on a vaccine. Luckily, they do have vaccines against some strains of coronaviruses, and they seem to be effective against this particular strain. Not exactly going to prevent, but they're working on it. Otherwise, treatment supportive. Now, the one that's making our news, it is in that severe acute respiratory syndrome group. It is in the SARS group, but it is a slightly different strain than what came out in 2002. So it's a different strain, but it still causes the severe acute respiratory syndrome. It's the SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus COVID-2. That's the kind of official name, and it causes what's known as COVID-19. Now, COVID-19 stands for coronavirus ID, and then the year that it was discovered. It was discovered in December 2019 in China. It's a new strain of virus. It's a new strain of coronavirus that causes the severe acute respiratory syndrome. It probably started in animals. Again, I hear things, maybe it was a bat, maybe it was some other domesticated animal. They're still doing genetic testing to find out. So we're still learning about the virus. Now, some of this you've heard already because COVID-19 is all over the news, but how it's being spread. Well, people are infecting other people. So we're not getting it from the animals anymore. It's spread just the way colds and flu is through droplets. So when we talk, cough, and sneeze on people, if those droplets get in the nose, the eyes, or the mouth, if we are touching contaminated objects and you're touching your face, your eyes, nose, or mouth, you can get it in the body. Now, some people that have it show no signs whatsoever. But the problem with asymptomatic people is that they can be spreading it without even knowing they're spreading it. Now, symptoms can start anywhere from one day after exposure, but it could be 14 days after exposure before you start to see any signs and symptoms. And the top signs and symptoms, and again, there's a lot of variety here. You could have, you don't have to have all of these. You could have fever, cough, sore throat, fatigue, shortness of breath, sudden loss of smell or taste, headaches, muscle aches, or diarrhea. Lots of different symptoms. And again, you don't have to have them all. If you have any of these symptoms, it might be a symptom that you've picked up this virus. And again, some have no symptoms whatsoever. Now, diagnosing it, they can't just go based on signs and symptoms because those are very similar to other diseases. So right now they do a throat swab. They do have a blood test as well, but they take a throat swab, a blood test, or they do a nasopharyngeal. They go way up there with a really long swab and they're gonna do a PCR. Now, because this has RNA and PCR is looking for DNA, they do reverse transcription. They take the RNA and they go backwards with transcription to make DNA. And then they're looking specifically for the DNA that this virus can make. Now, right now there is no specific treatment that we have. So symptoms, if they're mild symptoms, we try to treat them, lower the fever, relieve the pain. If they're more severe symptoms, that's when you have to go to the hospital because you might have to get put on a ventilator to help get the oxygen needed for survival. Now, to prevent picking up this particular virus, again, washing your hands frequently with soap and water, minimum of 20 seconds, using alcohol-based, at least 60% or higher of hand sanitizer. If soap and water is not available, cover your coughs and sneezes, use a tissue, use your upper sleeve, most even better, wear the mask. Um, making sure you're washing your hands if you cough or sneeze. Don't share food, don't share drinks, don't share phones. You know, don't share anything that someone else might be touching. Um, otherwise, you know, staying away from each other, that social distance, you know, depending on who you talk to, they say anywhere between three and six feet away so you don't get respiratory droplets on you. Don't touch your face so that you can't get it into those eyes, nose, and mouth. Avoid shaking hands, kissing, you know, instead, you know, wave to people, the elbow bump, you know, things like that. Avoid activities with large groups of people because, again, all it takes is one asymptomatic person to cough or sneeze and it spreads like crazy. You know, work from home, avoid non essential travel. And I'm like, it's, you know, constantly cleaning things, just, you know, prevent yourself from getting it. And if you think you may have been around someone that, has it, you know, keep yourself away from other individuals. 
now and I'm like just some things to you know prepare for if it does get into a family setting into your house you know making sure you local you alert the local health officials making sure you get tested to have that positive so they can do contact tracing to know where you are where you may have been exposed to anyone make sure you've got enough food and water and household supplies don't overstock up on the TP you know talk to your doctor about any signs and symptoms you should be worried about that might require hospitalization you know pretty much you know keep yourself isolated but they do also recommend you know get the flu shot one and I'm like it reduces you from getting other things you don't want to have the regular flu plus the coronavirus on top of it but a lot of signs and symptoms of the regular flu could be confused with COVID-19 and so if you get you know if you get the flu shot it can reduce at least one kind of virus that you might get otherwise you know if you do get sick don't travel cover your coughs and sneezes seek out medical attention don't go to the hospital but you can get tested they've got the drive-through tests and so they usually are going to screen you to look to see if you've got signs and symptoms or have been anywhere where they've had a high risk number of cases they will probably try to do some type of contact tracing so they can alert people that you may have been in contact with and everyone can then quarantine themselves otherwise you know wearing masks as much as possible if you're in any public place any area where you can be confined or in a crowded environment wear the mask if you're coughing or sneezing allergies can cause coughing or sneezing but you don't know if it's allergies for sure or COVID-19 so wear the mask if you're caring for someone that's sick wear a mask make sure they're wearing a mask now masks alone are not 100% effective you still need to make sure you're not touching eyes that are open you're not you're still washing hands you're still using PPE so I'm like a lot of COVID stuff a lot of stuff you may have already heard already but that was a lot of coronavirus stuff so we're still gonna look at one more group of enveloped it's not segmented and they have the positive strand of single-stranded RNA it's the Togaviridae and the Flavaviridae group and I'm like we group them together because a lot of them are arboviruses and I'll talk about what arboviruses are but we're gonna talk about one that first isn't an arbovirus the rubivirus or rubella and now the, the, the rubivirus also called the toga virus or in the toga virus group is called German measles it's rare that you hear of rubella or the rubivirus mostly they just call it ah, oh, it's the German measles spread through respiratory secretions as lots of things are we diagnose we can do antibody tests there is no specific treatment for the German measles it generally shows up eventually as a widespread rash fever sore throat body aches is what a lot of virus symptoms are but we can prevent the virus we do have the MMR that's the measles we've talked about the mumps we've talked about and rubella the other measles and again since we came out with the vaccine the number of cases have drastically gone down however we're still seeing some outbreaks in non-vaccinated areas of the countries and groups now other than a lot of the normal symptoms that this particular virus can cause one you know there's a couple bigger issues so postnatal so this is going to be in adults again you've got that fever sore throat tired rash and it usually lasts for three days and goes away that's not usually the issue we're concerned about with this virus it, that this is a rare virus that can cross the placental barrier most viruses cannot if you get the flu your baby's not getting the flu however if you get German measles or rubella your baby does too and it causes severe issues it can cause miscarriages it can cause lots of um, malformations in the body because it can cause heart abnormalities it can cause blindness because it can cause ocular lesions it can cause deafness this is a virus that's the number one cause of deafness in infants it can cause mental and physical disabilities so this is a virus that yes if you're an adult fine however if you're pregnant this is bad for that infant so if your infant survives it is definitely likely they're gonna suffer from some effect afterwards but it's preventable because if you get vaccinated mom can't get it which means baby can't so it's a virus we're not worried about adults 
getting it, we're worried about passing it on to infants during development. Another virus that's in this flavor of Ntogaviridae group that's not spread by insects or is not an arbovirus is hepatitis C. So it's in the Flavivirus group. It's spread instead, not by insects, but it's spread through bodily secretion. So blood transfusions or needle sharing. Now, a couple things with hepatitis C is that once you have it, generally you're gonna have it forever. So about 75 to 85% remain infected for the rest of their life. And it can have issues causing chronic liver disease. Generally you don't have a lot of other issues, but it can cause liver damage. Now, we don't have a vaccine, but we do have some treatments now. So just in the last five years, we do have some hepatitis, hepatitis C treatments that we are interfering with this virus's replication and it's gonna lessen any liver damage. And so people are living with this virus without any outward or any repercussions, but you do have to continually take the, that antiviral. Now the arboviruses that are in the Flava and Toga virus group. An arbovirus means it's a virus that's spread by an arthropod, meaning an insect. So whether a mosquito, a tick, a fly, a gnat, lice, and there's over 400 viruses that are spread by insects. A bunch of them in the Toga and Flava virus, the Flava, Flava virus group but also some bunya viruses, also some rio viruses, so other viruses out there can be spread by insects. It's just any virus that's spread by an insect is considered an arbovirus. Now, most of these cause mild fevers, so they're not usually a deadly virus, but some viruses can cause severe encephalitis, that's inflammation of the brain, as well as life-threatening hemorrhagic fever. Now, because they're spread by insects, the highest number of viruses that are arboviruses are usually found in the warmer climates around the, equa around the equator, the warmer climates in the world. So, you know, as much as we hate snow and freezing weather and negative 30 degrees in the winter, it kills a lot of stuff. And so we have less arboviruses here. <laughs> we have arboviruses. We have less of them, though, than if you went to tropical areas. Now, because they're spread by insects, if you can control the insect population, you can control the virus. And so that's one of our main ways for trying to eliminate or decrease outbreaks. Now, some of the arbor viruses that we do have around here in the United States, so these are all viruses just spread by insects, the West Nile virus, and we do have West Nile virus here in Wisconsin. Now, a lot of people don't show symptoms. 80% are asymptomatic and like around 20% usually show viral symptoms, the fever, the fatigue, the muscle aches, kind of your basic flu type symptoms, but a lot, about less than 1% develop neurological illnesses, which means it can cause encephalitis, it can cause meningitis, and it can be deadly. So West Nile virus is deadly. Now it is spread by in mosquitoes and it comes from birds. And so this is why if you ever hear you know, oh, they found a bunch of dead birds in an area. That's a concern. And you're like, why are dead birds a concern? Well, this virus can kill birds too. And so if they start to see a lot of dead birds in an area, they're concerned it could be this virus because there's mosquitoes everywhere. And a mosquito could be infecting or biting one of those birds and then infecting us. There's also Colorado tick fever. Luckily, we don't have that around here. The Eastern equine encephalitis comes from horses that are a big carrier of it our very own lacrosse encephalitis spread by mosquitoes. The St. Louis encephalitis, I don't even want to say this, the, the chikungunya virus, more in the Caribbean areas of the warmer climates down south, and the Zika virus. We do have cases of the Zika virus in Florida. I don't know if it's made it too far out beyond that. Again, spread by insects, by mosquitoes. Now, some of these arboviruses, though, that can cause some more severe side effects, some more deadly side effects. One is called yellow fever. Now, luckily, I'm like, it is spread by insects. It's spread by mosquitoes. However, we've eliminated it here in the United States. You, so you only have to be worried about yellow fever if you travel, because it's still out there. Luckily, we do have 
drugs and vaccines that you can get vaccinated for, that's how we've eliminated it, we do have vaccines for those if you're traveling. So if you know you're going to go somewhere where yellow fever is prevalent or even found, you can get vaccinated for it. Uh, but otherwise, it normally causes fever, headache, muscle pain. However, because it causes hemorrhagus, it can cause bleeding. So you can have bleeding in the mouth, nosebleeds, vomiting, jaundice, kidney damage, liver damage, and it is deadly. Luckily, we do have a vaccine. Dengue fever, also spread by mosquitoes. Generally, we don't have this particular species of mosquitoes. We don't have to worry about it here in the United States yet, you know, but, you know, climate change, maybe we will get the mosquito here, but it's called dengue fever. It can cause hemorrhagic shock. Pretty much, it's the first time you get bitten by a mosquito that has this particular virus. You don't suffer more than a few mild symptoms, but your immune system recognizes it and it develops antibodies. That's what we want it to do. The issue comes the second time you get bitten by a mosquito. Your immune system can actually cause a hyperactivity. It goes a little crazy. It's a hyperactive response, and it's your immune system can cause you to actually go into shock. It can cause blood pressure changes. It can cause extreme fevers, and it can be fatal. So it's one of those, the first time you get bitten, not bad. This again, because we don't carry the mosquito, the vector that spreads it, we don't have to worry about it here in the United States. But if you travel, we don't have a vaccine for it. Again, your best prevention is don't get bitten by mosquitoes, wearing that deep containing insect repellent, long clothing, don't go out at dusk when mosquitoes are most out. All right, a little quick concept check. Rubella is a serious infection for both children and adults. That is true. Now, children at MI generally are going to suffer more serious side effects than adults, but in a mic, it can still cause some very serious issues in both children and adults. Now, on to our next group. Sorry, I didn't put my big flow chart on here. This is the group that causes the HIV. These are all viruses that contain a specific enzyme called reverse transcript ACE. Again, enzymes usually end in ACE. So they can do reverse transcription. That's really unique for viruses to be able to do that. So these all viruses, I'm like, because it's not just HIV, there's another group of viruses that have this reverse transcriptase enzyme. But the most predominant virus in this group is HIV. It stands for human immunodeficiency virus because it causes the immune system to collapse. So you have a deficient immune system. So eventually when your immune system gets to the point that it can't do its job anymore, you now have acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. I mean, you've acquired an immune system that doesn't work. Now, HIV first was discovered in the early 1980s here in the United States. It's not been around forever. It has not been around in the world forever. We're not completely sure where it came from. Our best guess is, is that it came from an animal virus in monkeys, and then it mutated enough to cause issues in humans. The problem is this, because it causes a deficiency in your immune system, people die of it, but they don't die just of the virus. They die of other secondary issues that you can't fight off. So it can cause a severe pneumonia, uh, that's caused by a fungus called pneumocystis gyrovetsi. It can cause a cancer called Kaposi sarcoma, but it can also cause other symptoms. These are some of the initial symptoms, sudden weight loss, swollen lymph nodes, but it's eventually a loss of immune function. Now, as I said before, it has the enzyme reverse transcription. So it can take, it has a single stranded RNA but it can do reverse transcription. Here's the enzyme, the big blue blob. And so it's gonna first, it's gonna take that copy of single-stranded RNA and it's gonna make a copy of DNA. A single strand, because it's just making a copy. So if the RNA has an M, or not an M, if, it has, if the RNA has an A on it, it's gonna bring in a T for DNA. If it has a U, it'll bring in an A. If it has a C, it'll bring in a G. If G, it'll bring in a C, and so on. And so it'll make one copy of the DNA, then it gets rid of the RNA, it doesn't need it, then it takes that one strand of DNA that it just made, and it makes the other copy. So you now have double-stranded DNA. And it's that DNA 
because we have double-stranded DNA. This viral DNA becomes part of our DNA. It integrates into our DNA seamlessly. It's all double-stranded DNA. And eventually, yes, our cells become HIV-producing factories. Now, the structure of HIV can kind of tell a little story all in itself. So the RNA itself, it's two strands, the big orange squiggles of RNA, but the outside of it has these little glycoproteins. Now, there's two main glycoproteins, GP120 and GP41. It's these proteins, the GP120 and GP41, that make this particular virus infect not just humans, I mean, it does only affect humans, but not just any cell in the human body. It affects very specific cells in the human body. It affects white blood cells. So it can target macrophages, but can, you know, its main virus or its main cell it wants to get to are helper T cells. So it's a very specific virus looking for very specific host cells. And it's because of these glycoproteins on the outside surface. Now, there are two strains of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 is found, oh, if I don't get these confused, HIV-1 is found here in the United States and HIV-2 is found more in Africa. They do the exact same thing, but there are different strains of them. Now, how it knows to recognize very specific cells in the body is using those glycoproteins and then it's looking for a receptor that's CD4 receptor that we find in T helper cells. So it knows where to bind and what cells to infect. So transmission, how we pick up this particular virus, it's spread by bodily fluids. The top fluids that are most infectious that are gonna have the highest number of viruses is semen and blood. But breast milk is up there too. Babies can get infected from breastfeeding but mostly it is spread through sexual intercourse or transfer of blood products. Luckily, it does not survive long outside of the body, so it doesn't survive on surfaces at all. Now, HIV is the sixth most common cause of death among people in the ages of 25 to 44 here in the United States. Men account for 75% of new infections, and a lot of that is because of the semen is one of the highest infectious doses, so it is spread not just in heterosexual males, but also in homosexual males. IV drug users, again, also a top group of individuals that are spreading it. Now, the number of individuals that have this virus, there's around 35 million people in the world that have it, with around 1.2 here just in the United States. So it's here. It's here in Wisconsin. It's in Minnesota. It's in Iowa. It's in Illinois. And like this virus is here in every state in the United States. Now, when it gets into the body, when it gets into the cell, so it's going to attach it's going to enter, it's going to take its little orange single-stranded RNA, but then it's going to make double-stranded RNA. And that double-stranded RNA is going to go inside of our nucleus, and it's going to become part of our DNA inside of our nucleus. And because our DNA has viral DNA in it, our cells now have the means to make more viruses. So our cells start to make more single-stranded RNA. Viral RNA, they start to make all the proteins that make up the capsids, and then they get released from the cells to go find more cells to infect. Now, the stage, if you've been exposed to this particular virus, it could it's usually a couple weeks after infection that you start to see some initial symptoms, and a lot of the initial symptoms resemble mono that you've got an inflamed spleen, you're tired, you're achy, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes. But the interesting part is because right away, that number of viruses is spiking in about two weeks in the body. But then it starts to go away, but it won't go fully away. But your immune system starts to kick in. It does know that it's under attack. And so those symptoms can go away and you think that you're actually fine. And so you can go into what's known as the asymptomatic phase for years. However, this particular virus, although it might be under control a little bit with your immune system, the numbers will eventually start to creep up. 
and the virus will change a little bit and start to become, it will mutate and actually start to become more infectious and more deadly to our white blood cells. Now, we consider someone in the AIDS stage of HIV. So in this last stage, when the number of your white blood cells, your T helper cells, become less than 200 per microliter, which means you don't have enough white blood cells, specifically your T helper cells, to fight off infections, to activate B cells. This is at the point where you don't have a working immune system. Yeah, there's some cells there, but not enough to fight any kind of large scale infection. And so I'm like, this is when you start to get opportunistic infections. You might develop cancers and you're gonna see more symptoms again. Now, diagnosing it, one of the first things they're gonna look for are antibodies. We wanna know, has, the, has your body seen this particular virus? So the initial screening, they're gonna do an ELISA. An ELISA, again, you can run 96 different patients or more on one plate, all looking for the same antibodies. It gives you a fast antibody test. However, it might result in a false positive. I've known individuals where this has happened because even if you get one HIV virus in the body, it doesn't mean you know you haven't hit the infectious dose where it's gonna cause an infection. But just getting one or a couple HIV viruses in the body, your body might recognize it and get rid of it, but it will make antibodies against it. And so there are individuals that have been exposed to this virus, but at such a low quantity, they never picked up the virus, but they would still have antibodies and was, would test positive for antibodies. So it just gives you a small initial picture. It's kind of the quick, fast initial picture. They'll follow that up with a Western blot test. That again is gonna look, do you have enough of the antigens to actually say that the virus is in the body, not just antibodies. If the virus, the antigens are in the body, that's gonna show that you actually have an active viral infection in the body. The virus is in the body. Now, that can also have some issues too. There are individuals that will test negative for the Western blot. Again, do your body, you know, like it, it needs a, enough of the actual virus in the body to detect. So if you get detected or tested too early, you might not have enough virus in the body for it to detect. So they normally recommend if you, you know, had symptoms, if you tested positive for antibodies, if your Western blot test came back negative, they usually recommend you following up several months later and running another one just to confirm that it's not in there. And I'm like, we need, you know, you want to know if it's in there or not. Now, diagnosing to say you are now in the AIDS stage of HIV. Well, we say that you have AIDS if one, you have the virus, and two, if you have one of these other criteria. If you have that CD4 white blood cell count less than 200 per microliter, or if it's fewer than 14% of all of your lymphocytes out there, or you're experiment, experiencing one of the CDC provided lists of AIDS defining illnesses, meaning you have the Kaposi sarcoma, or you have the pneumonia from that gyrovetsi fungus. And so if you're experiencing one of these rare diseases that only affect those that have no working immune system and you have the virus, we can consider you as now being in the AIDS stage of HIV. Now, preventing and treating it. Well, we don't have a vaccine available. So to prevent it, monogamy, using condoms and universal precautions, making sure you've got proper PPE, making sure blood is tested before any type of blood transfusion or organ transplant, because we don't have a cure. However, we are at the point, we've put a lot of money into research, so we actually have some results of that. We do have a lot of drug therapies that can slow the virus down. So we've got different drugs that inhibit reverse transcription. If it can't do reverse transcription and make DNA, it can incorporate and become part of our DNA. We've got enzymes called protease and integrase that are gonna stop the virus itself from being uh, released from the cells, which means they can't go infect other cells. And so we're gonna inhibit the fusion or it can't fuse to our cells and get inside of it. We're gonna stop the integration. It can't become part of our DNA. And so we have lots of drugs. 
that can prevent the virus from taking hold. Now, just in the last couple years, so of course it's not in any textbooks yet, we do have what's called the PrEP. It's a prophylactic drug that you can take if you know you're going to be exposed to this particular virus. And the idea is that you're almost taking a bunch of these drugs ahead of time. If you can prevent the virus from ever taking hold in your body, it can't get into any cells, which means it's not going to infect them. You can actually prevent yourself from getting the virus. So we do, you know, we're taking the drugs. We're not waiting to get the virus. We are taking the drugs if you know you're at a high risk of possibly picking up the virus. Now there are other viruses that do have reverse transcription. So the main one, HIV, causes AIDS, it damages the immune system, but we have another group of viruses called the human T-cell lymphotrophic viruses. They are again are targeting the immune system cells, but these particular viruses cause cancer of your white blood cells. They cause leukemia. Leukemia is a cancerous disease of your white blood cells, uh, and they're acquired, which means you're not born with them. And I'm like, so they're acquired somehow. Now, we have two strains of human T cell lymphotrophic viruses. We have one and we have two. The human T lymphotrophic virus one is sometimes also called adult T cell leukemia that usually it's gonna cause damage to your T cells. They start to look strange. They're not rounded anymore. They say they almost look a little hairy, but it usually is gonna then show outward symptom as you're gonna have scaly skin, possibly ulcers or tumor skin lesions. It's a cancer of the white blood cells. The HTLV, human T lymphotrophic virus two, it again, it's still a retrovirus, but we don't know that it causes any distinct disease. We know it can do reverse transcription, but we're not exactly sure what dis specific disease that it would cause. Now we're gonna move on to our blue. So we just got done with the green, and I'm like those reverse transcriptase enzyme containing viruses. Onto the blue. So these are all naked, so they don't have an envelope. Positive sense, single-stranded RNA. Now if you notice, everything on here has single-stranded RNA, except our last guy that we're gonna talk about. So this is no different, except this is naked. They don't have an envelope. And our non-enveloped, non-segmented, single-stranded RNA has a bunch of viruses. <laughs> so I'm like, you saw a bunch more viruses. Still lots of things that can kill you. Well, our first group that we're gonna talk about are the picornoviruses, and they're named picorno because pico means small, like the piccolo. So these are very tiny viruses, some of the smallest human viruses that cause disease. And there's a couple important genre that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the enteroviruses, the rhinoviruses, and we're not gonna talk about the cardioviruses because pretty rare. So we're gonna talk about the main enteroviruses and rhinoviruses. Now, again, and I'm like, we're still not gonna talk about every virus out there, but we're gonna talk about, there's more than one enterovirus. There's really only one grouping of rhinoviruses. And I'm like, but we're gonna start first with the, I was gonna say, the enteroviruses. Now, they are called enteroviruses because most of them are spread fecal oral, not because they target the intestine, because entero means intestine, but they're spread fecal oral, fecal oral. And one of the top fecal oral enteroviruses, that's a picornovirus, is polio. It causes a condition known as poliomyelitis. We shorten it to polio. Now the polio virus, again, it's got a naked capsid and it's hard to kill. It's resistant to acid, it's resistant to bile in your stomach, it's resistant to stomach acid, it's hard to kill. Now, luckily, there's not a lot of cases of polio these days. Big reason, we vaccinated. We're at the point where we have almost and are getting to the point we've eradicated it from the world. We've eradicated it here from the United States, but it's still out there in the world. Now, the polio, it's spread fecal oral and it sticks to the cells of your digestive tract and that's where it multiplies and then it eventually gets into the bloodstream and can travel. 
Now, some are usually going to develop mild, nonspecific symptoms. That oh, you've got a headache, nausea, sore throat, muscle aches. Oh, maybe you have the flu. Maybe it's a cold. Who knows? However, it can get into the nervous system, and it can destroy the nerves that control the muscles, this particular skeletal muscles. So it can cause muscle pain. It can cause muscle spasms. It can cause inflammation of the meninges. And so I'm like, it can cause a lot of issues with skeletal muscles. Now, when the muscles can't work anymore because there's nothing to tell them to, to move, it causes what's known as flaccid paralysis. If there's no neurons telling your muscles to contract, your muscles aren't going to contract. They become flaccid. They're not going to work. Now, even if you survive polio, there is still a neurological damage that starts to show itself years later or sometimes decades later. And it's a condition known as post-polio syndrome, that any of the muscles that were affected when you suffered the first time with the virus, those muscles start to deteriorate. And it ends up that children usually are going to have to be, like later on in life, they're going to be in wheelchairs, they're going to need some type of braces on their legs, they're going to need crutches, they're going to need some type of assistance because there's been damage to their muscles. Now, most individuals that pick up this virus are asymptomatic, which again, could be spreading it without knowing it. Some can develop meningitis, some develop minor symptoms. And the smallest is right away they become paralytic, that it paralyzes the muscles. Now, it targets skeletal muscles. And again, one of the most important skeletal muscles we have is our diaphragm as well as the intercostal muscles between our ribs. And it leads to a condition known as bulbar poliomyelitis. It's rare. However, because your nervous system damage is so bad, your skeletal muscles can't work. And if you can't breathe, you die. However, we know that if you can survive it, you know, because you can survive it, your immune system can get rid of it eventually, it'll suffer, la suffer later, but if you, you know, you can survive it, but not if you can't breathe, that they will put individuals into these artificial tanks. Your head would stick out, and this is where the hole where your head would stick out, and the machine would do what your diaphragm does. You breathe because of pressure changes from your diaphragm and I'm like that you create that volume difference which creates pressure difference which causes air to go in and out well if your diaphragm can't do that this tube causes pressure difference it pushes in on your body when it increases pressure and causes air to breathe out and then it decreases pressure and actually causes your diaphragm and your lung capacity to go up and air goes in now I was gonna say, I'm like, that's your artificial ventilation. Again, a lot, if you, if you could get into an iron lung, you usually survived and got out of the iron lung with complications later on. And I'm like, but it still was a deadly virus. Lots of individuals died from it. And it took a long time before they even realized how it was spreading. So it was a fearful virus that killed lots of children because children are the bigger spreaders of it because they're dirty. It spread fecal oral. Yeah, you eat poop. You don't think about it, but you think of everything that touches and people don't wash their hands. And so, and kids are dirty. So it spread like crazy with kids. Now, luckily, we developed a vaccine. And so... Like Jonas Salk was the one that first developed. It's an inactivated polio vaccine, and it's extremely effective. Now, Carl Sabin came along and developed an oral polio vaccine. This is an attenuated live virus. Now, it because it has that live strain, it did have a stronger immune response and was a little more effective. However, we don't use it here in the United States because... There was one case in Europe in the 1990s where that live strain mutated to become an infective strain and people that got the polio vaccine got polio. So here in the United States, we don't even mess with that. So we always give the inactivated polio vaccine. But again, enough people are, are getting vaccinated against this particular virus that worldwide eradication is being attempted. Now, one note, because just in the last year or two, 
we've had another illness that's resembling polio that all of a sudden skeletal muscles aren't working anymore and so we call it you know it's a polio like illness it causes the acute flaccid myelitis it's similar to polio again a lot of infants and children are the top cases of it there's not a lot of cases but we've had some in minnesota i know and they're around again they think it is one of these enteroviruses but there's not enough individuals that have the virus and they can't get in because a lot of times by the time you have symptoms the virus could be gone and so then you can't find the virus if it's gone but this unfortunately the damage was done so they're still trying to figure it out but there seems to be another enterovirus in this group where polio is that seems to be around these days now some other enteroviruses that aren't polio viruses the most common are the Coxsackie viruses. Now they're named Coxsackie because they were discovered in a town in Coxsackie, New Jersey. And there are two strains, Coxsackie A and Coxsackie B viruses. And then we also have what are known as echoviruses. It's short for enterocytopathic human orphan. It was a virus that for a long time we didn't know what it caused. We knew how it was spread, but we didn't know what it did. So we called it an orphan virus. Now, most of these, they're all spread, fecal oral, they're enteroviruses. They are similar to some of the initial symptoms of polio that you might suffer from your basic virus symptoms, the tired, the fatigue. However, some have some more unique disorders or symptoms is that they can cause different respiratory infections, they can cause pink eye, and it's the Coxsackie viruses that can cause hand, foot, and mouth disease. Now, a few rarer strains of Coxsackie A viruses can also cause meningitis and encephalitis and even paralysis um, for the echovirus, but most of them are pretty rare. So if you've ever known kids that have, again, have a pink eye, it might be a Coxsackie I vir a, it might be a Coxsackie virus, it's usually the A strain. And I'm like, but hand, foot, and mouth disease is also a Coxsackie virus. Again, most individuals recover without any long lasting issues. And then we have our last group in our coronavirus group. It's a hepatitis virus, it's hepatitis A. It's also hard to kill, it's resistant to heat, to acid. A lot of individuals are asymptomatic, meaning they're carriers of it. But this is the hepatitis that spread fecal oral. Most hepatitises are spread by bodily secretions, bodily fluids like blood. This one's fecal oral. So it's our one hep that's fecal oral. Now, once it gets into the body, fecal oral, you eat poop, that's what it means. It gets to the small intestine, it enters the blood and then goes to the liver. It causes mostly more flu-like symptoms, but because it can get into the liver, it can cause inflammation of the liver. Occasionally, jaundice can happen. Now, there's no specific treatment. Generally, those that pick up hepatitis A recover without any long-lasting effects, but we have a vaccine for it too, so you can prevent yourself from getting this particular virus. Now, poliomyelitis, it is generally acquired. Ingestion, fecal oral, you're eating poop. Now, our next little group here is our human rhinovirus. This is the one I'm gonna say with certainty, you've all had a rhinovirus. There are more than 110 types of rhinoviruses and they all cause the common cold. Now, they have unique surface markers that make a vaccine unlikely and they are also changing all the time as well. And so there are lots of them circulating around in the population at any particular time. They're spread by contaminated hands, touching inanimate objects. So you're touching door handles, desks, chairs, you know, my anything that you touch, your phone you could be touching, and then it gets into the body, touching anywhere on your face, your eyes, your mouth, your nose. Now, rhinoviruses, they are sensitive, so you can kill it using acid, but the interesting part about a rhinovirus is that its optimal temperature growth, it grows happiest, reproduces happiest in cells that are a little cooler than body temperature. 
it likes 33 degrees Celsius, which is why it really likes to hang out in your upper respiratory tract, your nose, where it's a little cooler than body temperature. And so the initial symptoms, so the symptoms that it can cause headache, chills, fever, fatigue, sore throat, cough, and nasal drainage. It affects the nose. Rhino means nose. Treatment, well, you generally wouldn't get diagnosed for it. Most of the time you don't go to the doctor for a cold. You just treat it with over-the-counter type drugs. You're treating the symptoms, you're treating for the coughing, you're treating for the nasal drainage, you're treating for the headaches. Now your best bet is, you know, if you could not get it at all, is washing hands and making sure if you blow your nose, you throw that dirty Kleenex away and then wash your hands again because it's mostly spread by nasal secretions that eventually touch different surfaces. Now, a few more of our non-enveloped, non-segmented, single-stranded RNA viruses, and it's the Calissa virus group. These are believed to cause about a third of all viral gastroenteritis. This is your vomiting diarrhea. And so about a third of all viral causing vomiting diarrhea is usually the Calissa virus group. In this Calissa virus group is where we find our neuroviruses, which get nicknamed the cruise ship viruses. They're transmitted fecal oral, and when you got a lot of people that don't always wash their hands in very close quarters, all touching the same things, the same hand railings, the same plates and tables and whatever, it spreads like crazy on cruise ships. Now, it can infect anyone, so it's not going to only affect children or elderly or immunocompromised anyone at any time of the year, and it's going to cause those nausea, vomiting, cramps, and diarrhea. Luckily, most com recover completely, usually within a couple days, and without any long-lasting effects. It's just going to really ruin a vacation. And the last one that we fit into here, we usually talk about what the Calissa virus is because it's also spread, fecal oral. It's an entero, it's because it's so it's an enteric hepatitis, hepatitis is hepatitis E. Now, hepatitis E generally doesn't cause any big issues. It's a virus, yes, it can cause, you know, liver inflammation, but it goes away without causing long-lasting effects. The only big issue with hepatitis E is that it's fatal in 20% of pregnant women. They believe it is due to the hormones that pregnant women have elevated levels of that actually causes this particular virus to be more virulent and more disease-causing. So, and I'm like, for most individuals, no issues, not deadly, it goes away, but pregnant women, it can cause serious issues. So, because it is spread fecal oral, the best prevention is stop the fecal oral transmission. Good hygiene, washing hands after you use the bathroom, wash hands as much as you can before you're putting anything in your mouth. Now, our last group of RNA viruses, and thank you for sticking with me. Last group of RNA viruses is our most unique group because it has double-stranded RNA. And that's unique. RNA is always single-stranded, except this group. And it's our last group. There are Rio viruses. So they have an unusual double-stranded RNA. Now, the two best-known Rio viruses, one's just called Rio virus, the other's called rotavirus. They both kind of look like a little wheel, which is where it gets their name, a rotating wheel. And the real viruses usually cause upper respiratory infections as well as diarrhea. And the rotavirus causes pretty bad diarrhea. That it has caused fatalities because of the diarrhea in both infants and children. Now, we do luckily have a vaccine now for rotaviruses. But they said at one point rotaviruses were so common and they were found rampant in daycares because kids are dirty that it was a guarantee bef that before the kids turned four, they probably suffered from several various rotavirus infections. I mean, it's just a number one cause or a uh, top cause of virus of diarrhea in infants. So again, we can vaccinate against it and we're not too worried about this virus anymore. So we got through all of the RNA viruses again. Thank you for sticking with me. If you have any questions on any of the viruses, send out an email. Let me know if you have any questions whatsoever.